Today's top story from the perspective of someone who's there. You are looking live. This just in. Not my beat. Overreaction Tuesday time. Linnell is with us. Uh, I'm sure there's nothing, nothing that's got you hot under the collar about a, a 40 to 20 loss on national television to the Bears. I am a okay. Nothing bothers this young young whippersnapper. I'm all, I'm all good. <laughs> An unflap th- that should be your new Twitter bio is unflappable whippersnapper. Unflappable whippersnapper. I like it. I can do that. It. Should that should be your uh, your new Twitter bio, new Instagram bio, your just new bio in general. Um, all right. So there's so much to talk about with this game. Where do you want to start? Uh, where where are your takes at? And and then we can determine for those that are new to the segment. Basically, Linnell comes with his flaming hot takes, uh, and then and then I tell him whether or not he's overreacting. Although the takes, uh, he he he's come. Uh, much calmer than we've anticipated. And then he's just well, unleashed flames on the rooster. You've, you've left extra, extra crispy rooster on Wednesday. So come on, like, let's, let's well, bring well, it. Here, Where are you well, at? Really? Do go. not, let's, do not temper your takes for this show. Let's put some static in your hair, Craig Hoffman. I, I, my, my first overreaction actually happened yesterday. Um, okay. I was not a big fan and I understand it's a slippery slope to, to climb, so to speak. Josina Anderson, CBS sports had a report yesterday uh, basically sounded like she talked to some folks uh, that's in the upper management of the Washington Commanders. And she went on like a, she posted a really long tweet. And in that tweet, it said one of Josh Harris's biggest concerns after Thursday night's loss is how the fan base, I guess, will react emotionally. Basically saying he's worried about people not showing up anymore after what happened on Thursday night football. And like, I understand when he got here, it was like the middle of the summer and it wasn't much he could do, but like, that's, that's not what I want to hear. That's not what the fan base wants to hear. We just got drubbed 40 to 20. I don't really care about ticket sales. I need something to happen to this football team. I need him to put pressure on the coaching staff. And we already knew the reputation he had with the devils and with the Philadelphia 76ers as being a patient owner. But I feel like these situations are totally different than those because you're coming into a situation where your coach is in year four. You've had four years of data to see how this group does things. And I think if that is the big concern coming out of Thursday night, then maybe he's not paying as much attention to the football operation as I want him to. Yeah, I just don't I don't even know if it's overreaction. I think like you're just connecting dots that don't connect. Um, I just think there's a reality of the situation, which is he bought the team on July 20th. Like, what the hell do you want him to do? And I think realistically, like he does have to, one of the factors that he is managing is he has this honeymoon. Like he's trying to recoup money on his asset. That he's, a, he's a business owner. Like, of course he is. And the way he's going to ultimately do that is to recapture the fan base, which he wants to do both financially and altruistically. Like, let's even take the money out of it. Do you want him to do things in a way that maximizes fan happiness? Yes is firing everyone instantaneously perhaps going to give you a short-term boost sure but i'm not even long term is that actually i'm just talking about the 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 energy that comes out of the building i just would have liked the tone of what he was saying to be a lot more stern and a lot more like urgent and it it felt like the message that he gave or the message that was given to josina didn't have much urgency on. well i don't know how much that was coming from josh harris either well i honestly think josina talked directly to magic and i that would be my guess as well imagine like other is and magic was speaking for the other owners when she said that you know the other minority partners have a different stance on this and i think he was talking for himself well i think magic is hyper competitive and he looks at it but like with all due respect like magic is hyper competitive um you know if you know anything about magic as a player like that's how he was like he was a competitive psycho um but magic also just doesn't know what he's talking about on nfl football with all due respect, because like the X's and O's and like why it happens, like magic couldn't co-host take command with me the way Logan does. Like, let's be very clear. <laughs> that would about be that. hilarious, by the way. It but. would be, it would be an incredible podcast, but like, we're not getting breakdowns of what happened in cover two for magic Johnson. And so when it comes to actually solving the problems um, of what has happened with this team so far this year, like, I don't know that magic has the answers either. And I think Josh is paying closer attention to magic. And that's not like necessarily defending all the decisions that they made. Like, I think there's a lot of, schematic decisions and a lot of personnel decisions that are indefensible the problem is like i don't know not even indefensible some of them are some of them are just bad 
um, like run of the mill NFL bad. And the problem is I don't know how many of them can get fixed right now. Like I think they made a bunch of off season errors that are going to have to get fixed in the off season, like player personnel, staffing personnel. Like I, I don't think that the solutions are as easy as people want to make them seem. And so when it comes to like, but they're like back to kind of the original point here uh -huh. to like the fan base happiness point. Sometimes you do have to serve a head on a platter. Like, unfortunately, that is the world of professional sports. And I think the number of tickets that we're talking about that will swing on Ron Rivera's head on a platter is very small compared to the overall operating budget of what the Washington Commanders are as a business. With that said, it's important that he monitors that because if that, like the difference in individual ticket sales versus like, yo, our sponsorships are slowing down. And I think the biggest indicator, perhaps the canary in the coal mine, if you will, is season ticket sales. Like if that. all of a sudden the enthusiasm for next season starts to drop off dramatically, that's when you might have to serve up a head on a platter. And I just think through week five, you're not there yet. No. Also, it's not the best thing for I've I've actually come a little bit full 360 on this, not full 180, full 360. I started where I am. I got to a different point and then I came back to where I am um, on this. Like, I actually don't think that they're like making this move right now is good for basically anybody involved, except for the select group of fans who will be happy to see a head roll and will be pissed again in three weeks when nothing changes and it's not any better. I agree with you that firing someone right now isn't going to do anything. That's not really what I'm calling for. I just, if I'm going to hear from Josh Harris at this point in time of the season, I just wanted to hear from him condemning the operation, but like not full blown, like Ron and company are bad. Just the results that we put out. Like, I don't think we heard from Josh Harris. Like, that's the thing. I don't think jo with all due respect to Josina. I don't think Josina is talking to Josh Harris. The ownership group in its entirety. And I don't even want to just single out Josh Harris because that's unfair. I'm saying I just want more of a sense of urgency from the group in their messaging, right? Like it's all about recapturing the fan base. That's cool. We both know this though. The number one way to recapture that fan base is winning football games. Now there's nothing. Well, you, so I, hold I on. Let me agree. stop you there though, because I think that's an important point. So let's, let's bear down mm -hmm. on it. What is the thing that Josh Harris can do to help this team win football games? Is it statements of they better figure it out? Or is it supporting Ron Rivera as absolutely best he can? And then if it doesn't work at the end of the year, being like, hey, dude, I gave you everything you wanted and you still stunk. Look, I, I agree that like there isn't a whole lot you could do, but I'm nitpicking here because if I'm going to hear from the ownership group or representatives from the ownership group, I want them to tell the fan base and voice their displeasure to the fan base at the start hasn't been acceptable and that they expect better moving forward. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, I think we heard that we didn't need, again, all due respect to Josina, like well, we didn't need Josina. Magic tweeted it. Yeah. <laughs> like Magic, Magic, tweeted it. Magic Johnson after the game was like, that's not good enough. Yeah. And he's correct. The performance was not good enough. Um, but I don't think like it's an effort issue. I don't think that it's, you know, any of the like passion, like, I mean, may, maybe there's some of that. Maybe there's a next level uh, of passion and effort that could have been brought um, to that game. But also, like, I go back to the fact that they were playing on Thursday night after they faced the Eagles in overtime. Like, that is a brutal turnaround. Now, Chicago had a similar one, but, like, also Chicago played Denver. And Denver's an embarrassment of an NFL football team. So, like, they are different. Um, they did have to travel. You know, that's something for Chicago and in, in their, um, you know, their machination of last week. Like, it, it's not a, it's not – it's not an excuse. It's a potential reason. And I think we're going to learn a lot about this team and how they come out this week against Atlanta. And, you know, they had a mini buy. They had a chance to fix. If it's all tactical, you had a chance to work on your tactics this week. So you, you better have figured it out. You did. And one last thing on the old coach firing bit, which I'm not saying I would like to do, but this would be the time to do it. I feel like you had a mini buy 10 days in between. Anytime your team comes out as flat as Washington did Thursday night. I think all people should be condemned, but like that's, it's both sides of it, but that's on the coach. Get your guys ready to go like that. But it's also on the players, which is like, I'm torn. Yeah. When I'm you get smashed like that, there's enough blame to go around for everyone. Correct. So I, it, it's hard for me. I'm just more so disappointed because based on the statement I made, I don't think it was possible for them to <laughs> lose to Chicago. I just did. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it was definitely possible. And it happened in the exact way that we thought it might, which is like they're a tough team to prepare for in a certain couple of things. And if you give up explosive plays, which is where Chicago thrives, like you could you could be in for a bad one. It's the same thing that, frankly, scares the hell out of me for the Giants in a couple of weeks. Atlanta doesn't scare me nearly as much. Like, I could see how they lose to Atlanta for sure. Like, Bijan's awesome. Um, and they have, have not exactly been killing it against the run this year. Um, and some of the play action, like, I, I think it's Atlanta's a tricky team to prepare for. They're not great talent wise, but they're tricky. The giants are really bad talent wise, but schematically do the stuff that Washington's bad at. Like they yeah. blitz like crazy on defense and Washington's had trouble picking up pressures this year. Like that scares the daylights out of me. Um, they're not very explosive offensively, but that's a different story. Um, we'll deal with that in a couple of weeks. Uh, Linnell's with us. It's Overreaction Tuesday here on the Hoffman Show. Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app and streaming live on YouTube at the Team 980. All right, what's your next take? And then we'll judge overreaction or no. This is just based off some numbers I've seen from the past two weeks. I think Washington in coverage needs to go with a different philosophical approach. And what I've heard over the past 48, 72 hours and, and going back and looked at the numbers, they're playing a lot more man coverage this year than they were last year. And I understand last year is when they really started to click and connect in terms of the match zone, which is sort of like a pseudo man to man coverage anyway. But I, I just think it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me for them to go into this offseason if that's what they did and say, you know what, we're going to make schematic changes to how we play in the secondary you have the same group pretty much outside of one person in Emmanuel Forbes. And in college, I believe that was his strength, was playing man. But to if they're, if they're going out and willing to change the whole defensive approach in the secondary based off of one guy, then I, I, don't, I don't agree with the plan. I think they're playing more man because they want to try to force turnovers or something and – you know, or they trust their personnel, and I think it's a mistake. So the, I, to me, this is 100% not an overreaction, and I'm very much hoping that during this mini-buy, they self-scouted and went, nope. Uh, and especially now that you've got, you know, Percy Butler over the top and and Quan coming in, like, I, I don't know, man, it's hard. It, like, man is also simpler. It's like, hey, that's your dude. Um, you know, guard him. So these are know, NFL receivers though, man, it's hard. to Yeah, play. no. And that, and that's the thing. And, you know, against Justin Fields specifically, it's like, make that dude read a defense, reading a defense and man coverage is this set hut. Where's my matchup that I like bang. And you're going to throw the ball with anticipation on the break, uh, unless your guys out leverage and then you're going to get to the next guy. Um, but it's not, it's not like, Oh, this is cover two. Where's my, where's the route. I got to pick this player. Like I'm trying to isolate the corner. Like, is he dropping off? Is he underneath? Like you don't have to do any of the thinking that is required against his zone, and the throwing windows are often much cleaner against man. And that's where Justin Fields struggles is like reading the defense. And also like when we talk about marrying coverage and pressure, like right. they're playing man with not a lot of blitzing. And so you're relying on your front four to get home, but you're relying on front four against five, six, and seven blockers. Like they're right. keeping like the, the one thing that was an interesting takeaway from take command this morning is uh, the defensive line apparently played a lot better than people realized. And that's not surprising, but also like with the caveat that on some of the big explosive plays, like that's where they didn't get pressure, but like their pressure rates were insane in this game. Like almost half of snaps, they're getting pressure on Justin Fields. Even the the touchdown to, to more over Fuller in the back corner of the end zone, that's like shake Justin Fields' hands. Congratulations, man. That's a hell of a throw. And he got smashed in the face. Yeah. Like there's there is you know, I, I think a schematic flaw here of they are they are relying on that front four. Teams know it. They're leaving tight ends and backs in to chip Buffalo. or just straight double team. And they're leaving John Allen one-on-ones. Uh, and John doesn't look like John right now. Like, I wonder if the foot bothered him or if he's out of condition because the foot kept him out of the back half of training, whatever it is. But like, that's the guy that they've isolated on some of these plays. And it, it comes down to one guy winning a one-on-one -on -one, as opposed to one of four guys winning one-on-ones or three guys winning one-on-ones. And they're not really like simulating pressure and doing these types of things yeah. to make it so that if you're going to play like the long wind up here to getting back to the man coverage is, as you well know, like cut playing man for 2.5 seconds is very different than three. Yeah. 
So you Huge. have to cover longer. And that's, that's, I think where some of these problems are, are happening is you're relying on your front four to do something that's just not really feasible. And I do think that uh, you made a really good point. If you're going to play as much man as Washington has, send some extra pressure with it. Don't leave your corners on an island and ask them to cover, as you're saying, for unthinkable amounts of time. The one thing I will also say about the secondary in general, when playing man coverage and, and any coverage for that matter, which is why I go more, it's on the players and the coaches. Guys got to make plays, man. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of times on, on Thursday where guys just aren't making plays on the football. The game against Philadelphia – uh, the Sunday before, guys just not making plays on the football, missing tackles in open space. That's not a schematic thing. Guys just got to be better. And I think a lot of it may have, and I know the, some people are going to hate this excuse, but every team in the NFL is dealing with it. The shortened preseason and the guys not playing a lot of snaps during the summer and really getting live coverage, you're going to see it. And I think it's been a trend throughout the first month of the season for the past three years with this group, right? I think they come out of the block slow because they don't get a lot of work in the summer. And I think yeah. that could be debated one way or another, but I guess I'll save my, my next overreaction for my next overreaction because it is tied into the front four. Yeah, no, all right. Uh, just to wrap up that thought, I think that's 100% correct. Um, I think that, I mean, the numbers are staggering, first five games yeah. versus the the rest for Del Rio's crew the last four years. Um, but I do think the tackling has been a big part of it, and that is definitely a player issue. The one other thing that we talked about uh, this morning that I think is interesting is, like, situational play calling, too. You know, yeah. when are you bringing those pressures? Like, the the touchdown that they give up to Moore in the, on the first drive is, like, a great cover two beater. I kind of hate being in cover two there. Like, do you, it's third and 14. Like that's the one area Madden. You would never run cover two in that situation. Right. It's like, it's like, you know, Hey, we're going to run a, a kind of a corner situation here and we're going to attack the weak spot in cover two. And you're relying on your front four to not give the time to that to happen. Just play yeah. quarters. Like just, just have deeper guys protecting the stick slash the goal line there. And you don't have that problem. So situational play calling is something that I think upon looking at the tape, um, is is worthy of mentioning all right uh last probably last overreaction maybe we got time for two more but last last one make it good linnell as if your takes are never never have any spice um we kind of already touched on it a little bit but I, you may have debunked it already i'm disappointed in the impact the lack of impact that the front four is having and i don't want to just pin it all on them i think there's things that they could do schematically as well to help them um right. but it just feels like you know, this is a group that's got four first rounders on it, and like they're not impacting on a down to down basis on, on at the rate that I want them to. And I understand maybe I'm asking something that's unfeasible because of the numbers game. Sometimes they're working four on six, four on seven. When it just looks different, it, this past Sunday was really eye opening for me because I got to sit down and watch the other 31 teams across the National Football League: Bosa, Garrett, uh, Parsons. It just looks different from the other guys. And I, and I know maybe we don't have an alien along our front four, but they want to get paid like they're aliens. So it's like, I need you to do some of the freakazoid stuff. And I just want more from that group. I'm not saying I'm disappointed. I, I just want more because of all the expectations that we have for them. And in reality, this is like their first real full season playing together, you know, as with, with chase in the mix. Cause I know 2021, he got nicked up. So I, I just want more from them. I want, them to play less too they're playing a lot of snaps that is like, another can we part get of it. them can we get the rotation going can we get i'm glad you know we, we saw josh Pryor get elevated back to the practice squad maybe that means more snaps for someone else who's already on the active roster like i, I need guys to play more up front i need the rotation to be a little bit better as well i am just totally mystified as to why casey Tuhill played six snaps like uh, yeah. what do you do casey Tuhill's is a good football player it's fast and he's not gonna loaf He's right. not somebody you got to worry about chasing down a playback side. He's going to play balls to the wall every snap. Him, James Smith Williams, both. And when FA gets back, same deal. Like, I know Andre Jones played like five snaps and his season basically has ended so far because he had a really bad run fit. I think it was yeah. like he let someone get out. On like, round. he's on your roster. Like, let's, let's figure out a way to get him on the field and, and get some of these guys rest. Because I will say, if you want an alien, dude, Chase played his ass off in this game i mean chase chase young played so well in this football game and you watch him chase runs down from the backside like you watch the effort that he plays with and some of the wins that he gets pff has him with 11 pressures in this game chase was awesome 
Yeah. The problem is, is like, can you get that from other places? And can you do more to help these guys out? Can you make it so we can play as hard as possible on every, every snap by getting more rotation? Can you make their lives a little easier? Even if you don't want to bring pressure, can you simulate pressure? So I feel like we use that those words sometimes and and to to you know, it might just go over people's heads. So if you know what they are, great. If you don't know what a simulated pressure is, it's we're going to show blitz so that we, you know, again, simulate mm -hmm. that we're blitzing, get the offense to change its protection call. And then we're, they don't know who's coming and who's not. So we drop out, you know, one place and maybe get an overload somewhere else. So can you do more of that? And maybe that does occasionally drop a chase or a Montez into coverage and you, you, undercut what would be a hot route and bring Jamin Davis on a blitz or Cam Curl on a blitz or or you bring your corner. Like there's ways to rush with four that still feel like a blitz to the offense. And it rushes their process. It change it messes with their protection rules. And Washington's just not doing that stuff with any kind of regularity. And by the way, it's something that you can't just be like, oh well, you know, a few teams do it. It's happening to the offense every single week. And so most teams in the one. NFL feel like they do this and Washington just hasn't done a good job with their pressures this year. They're relying on that four man front, which like philosophically I understand, but then it becomes very predictable and very easy. You just leave extra guys in and trust that you can beat this back end. And that is what happened in, against Chicago. And it's what's happened. Uh, I would say multiple other times in other games this season. The overall word I'd use to describe what they're doing defensively is just, just vanilla. It's vanilla. They have a lot of talent on that side of the football, and I think you can get the most out of them by by complexing some things and, and making the other team's quarterback think. I think, like, Justin Fields is somebody I would have tried to throw the kitchen sink at. He's having issues. We've seen him have struggles in the past. Make the game as difficult as possible for him. Make him think. And when you're playing a bunch of man-to-man -man coverage, as you mentioned, there ain't a whole lot of thinking you have to do. No, that's for sure. All right, that is overreaction Tuesday. What's your uh, what's your schedule for the rest of the week? Are you roostering? Are you what? Are you, what are you got overtiming? On, what are you? I'm on what are you doing? Overtime tonight, Wednesday, okay, Thursday. Every I think I'm on overtime every day this week. So yeah, we're a, in this. We're we're in like ultimate overtime mode right now, where the Caps yeah. haven't actually started yet, and we're still waiting on some of the college basketball. There's a lot of overtime shows, so a lot of Linnell yeah. at night. On 106.7 The Fan, make sure you check him out there. And then, of course, Burgundy and Gold Game Day Live. The in-game show on Sundays follows the Take Command pregame show. Uh, they take live calls. They react live. Linnell tries really hard not to cuss. Have you ever cussed on that show and had to have some the producer bleep it? You've, you've kept yourself in, not. We had, in check. We had a, during the postgame show, we had some, some callers call in and swear, but mm. we dumped it as quick as we could. I've, I'm actually been a cool cucumber during that show. Until Ron came out of the locker room and said that he let the guys talk to themselves. That that kind of set me over the edge. I kind of loved that, honestly. Like I did find it hilarious. Grant and I were, were texting about that because Ron just stands there with the sidelines and it's like, don't you have anybody you could talk to in the headset or talk you to know? in the conversation? And so we're talking about who just because that was also his thing in Carolina. Like my my uh, one of my really good friends is a, a Panthers fan um up here, and obviously I know a, a ton from having grown up down there. But Sam used to always just scream. He just stands there with his arms crossed. He doesn't talk. To and I'm like, yeah, now, now I get exactly what you're saying. It, it's um, who he is, but darn, I wish. But like, fun. also, if your leaders are going to step up in the locker room, like, I'm cool with that. Yeah, because the last thing I wanted to, Ron Rivera to do is cut John Allen off while he's trying to hype the defense up. That would really, that wouldn't be good for Ron. Probably wouldn't no. be good for Ron. No. I have a bonus overreaction. Okay. Overall grade after five weeks, D minus on this free agent and draft class. D plus is what I said I'd do. I'll go D plus. Um, that, it's just, just not. Who's good. not failing? Nick Gates. Nick Gates is my non failing yeah. grade. Yeah. And Wiley's, I Wiley's probably his, not failing. That might be I a little bit of failing. an overreaction. Wiley's, yeah. Wiley's been, Wiley's been exactly what I thought he would be. Um, now, if you want to say what that's worth for the price and all that kind of stuff, like, yeah. okay, if, if you want to give him a C minus, like I'm fine. Gates, Gates has been fine. Um, they obviously yeah, haven't played two of their rookies at literally at all. Other Stromberg had like five snaps one game. And I think um, Stromberg is going to be a good player. Yeah. I, I don't get why they signed Gates and also drafted Stromberg. Like that's again, use of resources. That's a, that's, that's a Hoffman rant that is Hoffman ongoing. Rant. That's not an overreaction. That's just analysis right there, bro. It's just a take, it's just a take people. It's just, just a take with thought. 
and purpose. Thought. Something. An informative thought. Yeah. All right. Go go rest up. Uh, overtime coming up in just a little bit on 106.7 The Fan. And, of course, Lanell will be back with us next Tuesday. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Appreciate you. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.